Welcome back to emergency medicine video on shock. We will discuss the first three types of shock in this part. That is septic, hypovolemic, and obstructive shock. We'll go through what each one is, how the patient might present, and how we should treat it specifically. First, septic shock. Septic shock occurs where there is an infection that causes significant peripheral vasodilation. Because of the significant peripheral vasodilation, there's decreased systemic vascular resistance. Because of the pooling of the blood in the periphery, there's decreased venous return. Because of that, intravascular volume now decreases. On the other hand, sepsis can also cause myocardial depression and causes decreased cardiac output. Those are the reasons that sepsis cause shock. The patient will present with signs of infection. Sometimes they can be subtle. It's up for us to find them. They might have a fever. On examination, we want to be looking for any signs of infection. So we'll start with the ears, the throat. Looking for neck stiffness that may signify meningitis, sputum production, cough for pneumonia, abdominal pain, any dysuria that signifies any urinary tract infection. We're also looking for cellulitis in the extremities or any part of the skin. Due to the peripheral vasodilation, the patient who is in septic shock will be warm and flushed also known as warm shock. They're often tachycardic, and their pulse pressure, which is the difference between their systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure, can be high. Remember in part one, we talk about the end organ dysfunction. So don't be surprised that the patient in septic shock may have changes in their cardiac output because of ischemia or arrhythmia. They might be confused or have decreased level of consciousness because of central nervous system involvement. On top of whatever infection they have, they may also have signs of ARDS or pulmonary edema in the lungs as well. So on examination, we want to look for those. What about labs? On top of what a shock patient might get, Septic shock patients might also have a much higher white blood cell count and an increased lactate. In terms of other labs, we also want to look for the source of infection. That might mean urine and blood cultures, chest x-ray for pneumonia, may even lumbar puncture for suspected meningitis or encephalitis. The diagnosis of septic shock is a patient in shock who has signs of infection. The main treatment for septic shock is large volumes of intravenous fluids and early broad spectrum antibiotics. It is not uncommon for patients to get three to five liters of IV fluids quickly in the course of their treatment. Sometimes patients might receive blood or a vasopressor after the fluids is being given. The vasopressor of choice can be dopamine or norepinephrine. We often insert a Foley catheter to measure urine output. Sometime a central venous line would also be inserted as well. Next, we will discuss hypovolemic shock. This is the most common type of shock. It either occurs because of volume loss of blood, as in trauma or a GI bleed, or fluid, as in burn, vomiting, or diarrhea. Patient in hypovolemic shock will be preferably shut down with poor perfusion, 
also known as cold shock. They're usually tachycardic. Their pulse pressure will be narrow. On history and physical examination, we'll be looking for any focus or sources of blood loss or volume loss. It could be asking for any bleeding history from the GI source, the GU source, any vomiting or diarrhea, any history of trauma, and again on physical examination, we will be looking for any signs of bleeding sources or volume loss. In terms of lab, the hypovolemic shock patient might have a low hemoglobin if they've been losing blood. On the other hand, if all they've been losing is fluid, their blood will actually be hemoconcentrated, so their hemoglobin might look much higher. Their creatinine, on the other hand, might also be higher as well. On top of all the labs you order, please remember to do a pregnancy test on all childbearing age women since a ruptured ectopic pregnancy can cause significant blood loss and therefore shock. The treatment for hypovolemic shock is fluid. We often start with intravenous crystalloid fluid such as normal saline or Ringer's lactate. If the patient has significant blood loss, we will try to do two things. We will first try to replenish the blood loss. And number two, we want to stop the bleeding. That might mean going to the endoscopy suite for a GI bleed or going to the OR for the trauma patient or the ectopic pregnancy patient. Next, obstructive shock. It happens when there's blockage of blood flow from the heart. It can happen for a few different reasons. In a tension pneumothorax, let's say this is the collapsed lung, more air filled from this space will cause the mediastinum to be squeezed to the other side, and that would decrease the blood flow from the heart. In a cardiac tamponade, there is now lots of fluid in a pericardium, and now that is squeezing in the heart to decrease the blood flow. Also, if there is a pulmonary embolus, then the pulmonary blood flow is obstructed, causing decreased blood going out from the heart. How do these patients present? In the case of the tension pneumothorax, you expect the patient to have shortness of breath, decreased breath sound to that side, increased JVP, and tracheal deviation to the unaffected side. In a patient with a cardiac tamponade, you expect decreased heart sounds, increased JVP because of poor venous return. In a patient with PE, the standard PE symptoms such as pleuritic chest pain, shortness of breath, any signs that's compatible to a DVT would also be present. In terms of diagnosis, if you see a patient with a deviated trachea, decreased breath sounds, increased JVP, you know there is a tension pneumothorax, and you don't have to wait for a chest x-ray to make that diagnosis. In terms of tamponade, bedside ultrasound will show you a pericardial effusion, and ECG might show small voltages. For a diagnosis of PE, if the patient is stable, a CT chest would give you the most information. What about treatment? We often start with giving IV fluids first to patients who are in obstructive shock. However, as you are examining the patient, if you have a suspicion of a tension pneumothorax, we treat that by a needle decompression followed by a chest tube. If there is cardiac tamponade, then a pericardiocentesis is used to get rid of the fluid around the heart. If the patient has a pulmonary embolus, anticoagulation and sometimes thrombolysis would be used to treat that. Those would be the specific treatment 
for these specific kinds of obstructive shock. In summary, we discussed three different kinds of shock. First, there's septic shock, where the patient might have a source of infection. The treatment is loss of IV fluids, antibiotics, and vasopressor. The next shock we looked at is hypovolemic shock, either due to blood loss or volume loss. The treatment is IV fluids, blood if necessary, and stopping of ongoing blood loss. Lastly, we talked about obstructive shock that is due to a tension pneumothorax, pericardial effusion, or a pulmonary embolus, and we discuss its treatment. Next, we'll finish up with cardiogenic shock and anaphylaxis in part three.